Hey y'all, welcome uh, to GovLove. Um, coming to you from Jacksonville, Florida, this is GovLove, a podcast about local government. And we're brought to you by engaging local government leaders. I'm Ben Kittleson, senior consultant at RefTelus and GovLove co-host. Uh, we've got a great episode for you today. We're gonna be talking safety and transportation and planning. Um, but first, the best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGL member. Uh, engaging local government leaders is a professional association engaging the brightest minds in local government. And your membership helps support this podcast. So if you want to hear more uh, conversations like the one we're having today, go become a member. Now, let me introduce today's guest. Uh, Connor Semler is the is a principal planner at Kittleson & Associates, a position he has been in since uh, 2022. Uh, but he served in several roles for the firm for the uh, over 15 years in, in two separate stints. Uh, Connor drives uh, draws on his experience in urban planning, traffic engineering, and technical research uh, in complete streets design. Uh, he's highly regarded for his ability to leverage transportation design to create livable and healthy communities. And we're going to be talking about a, a recent report uh, that he was involved in called Roadway Cross Section uh, Reallocation: A Guide, uh, which we'll we'll link to as part of the show notes. But with that, Connor, uh, welcome to GovLove. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, and for and for cl- close listeners, I'll just say, um, although I've known of Kittleson and Associates <laughs> for many years, I did not. Uh, I have no association with them, so <laughs> it's it's fun to get kind of a uh, finally make a connection at the firm that um, I've been like uh, I've, the people have asked me about whether or not I've been associated with for for many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have likewise not known about you. Uh, yeah. but it was it was funny when you when you introduced yourself. I was like Kittleson, what? <laughs> It's not exactly a common name, so I no. was like, "We must, my family must be connected somehow." But <laughs> and you are an E. L. Kittleson, which I'm sure you deal with even more uh, painstakingly than I have to. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very rare. Awesome. Well, well, Connor, uh, we have a tradition on the the podcast to do a lightning round to get to know our guests a little better, mm-hmm. let you let you warm up a little bit. Um, so, my first question for you: What's the last great book you read? Uh, I, <laughs> I most of my reading these days is with my children. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, my, my six-year-old is, is reading to me a lot, which has been probably the most enjoyable reading that I've experienced in a long time. But my nine-year-old is uh, going back and rereading some of the books that I enjoyed as a child. And she just is right now reading a book called Maniac McGee, which was like my absolute favorite book growing up. So I'm going to use that as my answer for this. Awesome. That's, yeah. Well, I'm... Uh, we, we were talking before we started recording that we I just had my f- first child uh, she's four and a half months old um, and uh, mm-hmm. we kids books are great <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of kid book ahead of you <laughs> yeah I'm sure it, yeah it only intensifies but I was like we've, we've been not that she's like you know absorbing much of it right now but we're reading grumpy monkey before bedtime I was like this is a great book <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, all right so my next linear question for you what's the first album that you bought oh um this is I remember going to the the CD store. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, out in Buffalo, and I I wanted the album by Ten Thousand Maniacs, and my dad bought it for me. That's, I think that was the first album I ever got. Awesome, very cool. All right, and then my next letter question for you: uh, cake or pie? That is easy. We are pie people. We, in fact, at my wedding, we had pie, not cake. Oh wow! Really? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> what kind of pie is a wedding pie? We had we had we had many pies. Uh, uh, you know, fruit and, and cream pies of all kinds. That's awesome. <laughs> Very mm-hmm. <cool>. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Then my, my last letter on coaching for you, where do you go for inspiration? You know, I think like a lot of people, I, I take travel and seeing places as a, as a source of inspiration. Recently, I've had the opportunity to work on some bicycle planning projects in different places. And just this year, I've been in San Antonio, Texas and Anchorage, Alaska, places oh, wow. where you might not originally initially think about them as biking places and to, to yeah. go see the the energy around the community that's trying to make those places better for biking really inspires the work that i do and i'm happy to have that opportunity very cool yeah wow yeah An- anchorage that, that'd be a fascinating place for <laughs> to, to bike yeah, <laughs> i was there in september and we've helped them build their first separated bike lane bike lane with posts between the, the travel lane and the yeah. bike lane and they're just sort of exploring it, trying to feel it out. And the, just the community that came together to make it happen and everyone sort of pitching in to help help make it work is really, really, really awesome. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. 
Well, and that's a great transition to one of my favorite questions to ask is about kind of your path to the position you're in today. And, and maybe it, um, I'd love to hear about how you ended up in, in your current role and working on these issues, and, but also a little bit maybe more about the type of work you do, because I'm, um, you know, Kittleson and Associates, other than, you know, sharing a name with, <laughs> with the host of this podcast, um, what, what is the kind of work that you're doing? And then, and then, yeah, how'd you end up kind of doing this work? Yeah. So Kittleson is an engineering and planning firm focusing on transportation. <clears throat> and I found my way into the urban planning field in college when, when I realized that I could combine my love of cities with a profession. And, and then in grad school, while I was studying planning, I discovered that that transportation was where I wanted to spend my energy, where, where I think a lot of the key decisions and opportunities and challenges of our cities come together. So I did a slight specialization in transportation and then ended up taking my first job out of college with Kittleson out in Portland, Oregon, um, where I we, we got rid of our car, moved, we moved there, just... Um, trying to embrace the lifestyle out there and, you know, really became to understand how much opportunity there was to improve cities through, uh, you know, less reliance on driving on, on vehicles. <clears throat> um, and so I, I've worked at, yeah, I worked at Kittleson for virtually my whole career. I had a, a brief diversion when I went to go, uh, I worked for a nonprofit here in Boston for a short time, but the rest of my, my career has been in transportation, planning, engineering, um, and I think the real turning point in my career was getting the opportunity to work on what's known as the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide. And so NACTO is an is a, a association of planning professionals, transportation professionals, aiming to improve guidance and direction for cities that are that want to change the way their streets work. And um, they have become one of the you know premier sources of information for street design for our industry um, and and I had the I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time to get to work on that guidance when it first came out and then that sort of springboarded me into a career in developing doing research developing guidance for street design um, and also working with cities across the country to to make changes to their streets yeah no that, that's fascinating um so I definitely want to ask about that that neck neck I mean now I'm not gonna be able to say it either neck door report uh, yeah. but so the, the work you do with cities, is it primarily like around, you know, hey, there's a new development coming in and we want to figure out how to, you know, design the streets and transportation system to kind of work with it? Or is it doing kind of big, you know, I don't know, citywide, like transportation planning on street networks and, and, and bicycle networks? Or like, what is the, what are the, maybe the types of projects that you work on with, with cities? Yeah, it can be all of those things. It yeah. can also be um, working with cities and states to address specific safety problems or, or, um, you know, this, this, this street has an opportunity to be reconstructed because it's come along in the cycle or there's, yeah. there's some, there's some impetus to, to look at how the street's working and we'll work with the official city and state officials as well as the community to think through what it should be as we rebuild it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it can be high level planning, thinking about the direction over time, all the way down to um, we're doing quick build tactical improvements in Boston really after people make three one one complaints because it's not safe to cross the street by their house. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah, that, that, that makes total sense. So you might be doing a resurfacing on main street one day and mm -hmm. the next day doing, yeah, a pedestrian network. Uh, exactly. Yep. Very yeah. Cool. Um, well, and, and so that NACTO report, can you maybe, you know, for, our listeners yeah. that are as in the transportation planning world. Can you talk more about, you know, what that, what that is and maybe some of the guidance that you worked on there? Yeah. So, so the short history is that for a long time in our profession, there was a body called AASHTO, which is the American Association of State Highway Transportation Engineers. So state highway engineers that did research and developed guidance for street design that informed a lot of the work that was done across the country. Um, and as just as a, as a, uh, as a product of where they worked, state highway engineers tended to think about transportation from a more rural or suburban uh, driving focused environment. And so a lot of the guidance they developed was focused on those needs, understandably. 
uh, but there wasn't really the same sort of attention given to city transportation challenges. And so that was, I think that was the impetus for forming NACTO. It started with major cities, New York, San Francisco, LA, coming together and creating this entity, which then you know, identified the, what the needs and went to, went to work on creating this first document, which was the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide. What is, what is the design guidance for making our streets more bikeable? And that was the, the guide that I, I had the opportunity to participate in. Um, and since then, they've created guidebooks for just general street design, for transit street design, um, and uh, you know many other sort of resources they've created to help the industry and cities in particular make choices, do designs that serve their needs. So it's not just that car centered, especially highway focused, you know, planning, but you're you're incorporating all these other uses, yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And so what, um, you know, because I think I think I read that that report, the, the the one that you originally worked on, is probably I don't I don't know you might have said it too, maybe ten years or or, or so old. Is that right? I think it was around twenty ten. Yeah. So, so years. just you know, anecdotally, what's been kind of the implementation, or how what have you kind of seen? Uh, how how have cities used it, and and we'll we'll link to that report as well. I think it's, it looks like on their website, it looks like they're going through an update for that yeah. as well. Um, but we'll, we'll link to made, that for our listeners. Go ahead. Sorry about that. They have made updates continuously over time, yeah. but they are right now going through a, a significant update that will be, I think, released pretty soon. Uh, so I, you know, you you can look at the proliferation of bike facilities in cities, and you can see it really take off around that time frame, 2010 yeah. and after, as, you know, a number of things have come to, come into play. This this guidance being available is one thing. NACTO also puts on an annual conference that is very well organized, very well executed, and popular to attend for city officials across the country, which not only lets them come and learn about best practice, but also talk to each other and mm. build off of each other's lessons and create a community of city transportation officials and, and, you know, other city officials to continue to advance the state of the practice and what is, how the streets are working in, in cities yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we'll, uh, yeah, well, like I said, we'll be we'll sure to link to that just so folks that maybe aren't in the planning world every day can, can take a look at that. Cause I thought it was pretty interesting even just to skim through at a high level. Um, yeah, cool. So the 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 new kind of guide that you're that you helped develop that's more much newer. <laughs> it's <laughs> called Roadway Cross Section Reallocation: A Guide, and yeah, you, know, you guys have a little write up on on your website about it that we'll we'll we'll, we'll include in the show notes as well. Uh, but maybe um, uh, you know, this guide is more focused on safety standards and balancing different uses. So maybe as a starting point, how how did this kind of come about? What are why why was this an area of focus for for you and and, and the firm? Yeah. So with a, you know, uh, I'll apologize for the slew of acronyms uh, and and agency <laughs> jargon, but yeah, you're in good hands. This, this audience knows, <laughs> knows its way around some acronyms. Yeah. So that this research came was funded by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program (NCHRP), which is funded by essentially the National Academy of Sciences, uh, and they they take that money is pulled together from states across the country, and I think as well as some federal sources to mm -hmm. fund research needs in the transportation in the in transportation industry. They use the word highway here, that refers. That's just the word for all surface streets, all streets. Um, so every year, there's a dozen or more research questions that get funded. Um, to and then and then a consultant or consultant team is hired to research the question and write a product that does the, its best job to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So the, this question was basically, how do we weigh trade-offs in our streets? Hmm. So when we're thinking about the way a street works, how do we decide the relative value of a lane for cars versus a lane for bikes versus a lane for parking versus a bus lane versus a wider sidewalk, all of the different things that you can imagine that make up a street. And I use the term street from like edge, end of sidewalk to end of sidewalk um, or building to building. 
um, how do we decide what is the value of each element and what is the quote unquote right we use the word cross section the right yeah. um, makeup of that street um, the history is you know that sounds like a pretty simple question and how can we be 60 80 years into this profession without knowing the answers to that but the reality is a lot of the energy that's been put into transportation decision making over the decades has been understanding at a very minute level how traffic patterns work especially at intersections where the traffic signals are mm. uh, and then and and that has been used to create sort of the minimum standards that all streets need to serve. You, know, you mm-hmm. might have heard of the phrase like level of service, yeah. a level of service score that is, you know, that, that has a letter grade assigned to it. Uh, that is, that has always been first and then everything else sort of fall, falls to, falls to the um, secondary consideration after that. Yeah. So, um, so I guess, so just to like kind of maybe underline what you were saying there. So the, so in maybe past practices, this intersection needs to have four lanes, you know, go, you know, two go in each direction. And so that means that's what the score is going to be kind of, or that's what the design is going to be for that, that stretch yeah. intersection, intersection. Is that, that's kind of where you're that's right. That's right. Yes. So yeah, to, based on how many cars we, we know are driving through this intersection today and, and we anticipate driving through in the next 10 years based on, you know, gr- growth models and how many cars are going on the side streets and how the traffic signal operates, we can predict with a pretty high level of accuracy how much we use, the average delay is the measure. The average user driving through that intersection, how much delay they can anticipate um, during rush hour. So if it, if that delay is a minute or less um, in, in rush hour, we more, we more or less think that's okay. I'm, I'm generalizing. If it gets to be up to like a minute and a half, then we use the word failure. We say that intersection is failing. And and engineers are bred to not allow failure, right? If a bridge fails, that is a disaster. If a building fails, that's a disaster. Um, and so it sort of became, I think, ingrained in our profession that that sort of it's 80 seconds is the threshold for failure at, uh, for that measure. If we trigger that, that outcome, then we go and rework everything to make sure we can get back below failure. And then we can start thinking about those other uses of the those other pieces. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, as you said that I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners, this may, this, the same thing may have occurred is, uh, there, I can think of several intersections that are like, well, that, why is there so many lanes here? Uh, but it's because it, like you're saying, it's built for that, that rush hour, that peak demand right. when most of the time it's probably, it probably isn't necessary to have that many lanes or that many that that much street for for the for the regular use everyday use yeah and that's exactly the opportunity that we saw in this research again the <clears throat> the methods that have been ingrained in our guidance for as a profession have determined that the you know the peak 15 minutes a day the busiest 15 minutes of the day is is what we would need to we need to design to not fail and then we don't really ask what happens the rest of the day in fact you read a traffic study it won't even ever address what happens the rest of the day uh, but but the reality is that that what you're describing the the street you're driving on that has far more lanes than scenes is necessary at you know eight o'clock at night becomes becomes challenging for a number of reasons it creates a condition where cars drivers will go very fast because there's wide open space it creates a condition where there's an enormous distance for pedestrians to just get across the street. And um, we see, wherever we see those wider streets, we see higher incidents of crashes involving pedestrians. Um, these wider streets be, are not comfortable for most people to ever bike on. And on and on it goes because we constrained ourselves to that 15 minute standard. Yeah. Well, and, you know, as someone that's biked on a, a street with <laughs> more lanes of traffic than you want, that I, I can agree with that. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't feel very comfortable. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, and I also the other thing I want to underline and kind of you're, you're talking about the, maybe the, the past approach is that it's only valuing that through time for cars 
and it's not balancing what you, I think you kind of shaded there and then we'll talk more about it, that safety piece for other people or, or cars for that matter. That's like what, what makes it thing safe? It's only that throughput that's kind of prioritized, right? Absolutely. And, and it doesn't even really take into consideration that delay time for people who aren't in cars. So yeah, if we had yeah. a, if we have a intersection with a pedestrian delay over 90 seconds, no, no engineer would ever tell you that it's failing. That would never even, cause they would never even think to suggest that. <laughs> yeah. They may um, not look at that. <laughs> they often will not even look at it and that's changing. And there's a, there are a number of, there's a lot of professionals that are, are waking up to this and there's a lot of people working to change these, these things, but I'm, I'm describing sort of the status quo as it has yeah. been for most of the history of our profession. Yeah. And so, you know, before we get into maybe the guide and how, how we'd like to see the status quo change, is there anything else about the status quo that like, you know, that, that, that we can, we can need it addressing or, or needs to be changed or you guys looked at as part of this uh, process? I think that we covered the, the primary, <laughs> yeah. the primary situation that we're trying to unpack. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that safety, the bouncing other uses and then, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I think, uh, in the write up on, on your guys' website about the guide that there's a, you know, some, tr- there's a discussion about trade-offs associated with kind of different designs. And so maybe, you know, before we get into some of the more specifics, like what, what are some of those trade-offs that like a lay person may not, may not notice as they're kind of, you know, sitting at an intersection waiting for the, <laughs> the walk sign to change or something. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to, I can get into the weeds a little bit and go back to your, your example of a, a four lane intersection. Um, so, th- so at some point this intersection was designed with four lanes and it worked well, and then development occurs along the corridor and there's more traffic. And so, um, through one trigger or another, maybe a new development wants to come in, they go and study the intersection and they, they determine, oh, it's, it's now with the additional traffic that we're expecting, we we will predict that we will be into that failing threshold of, of intersection delay for people driving. And so what are we gonna do? And so we people we go into our traffic models and we start to tweak the way the intersection works. You can do that through adjusting the way that the lights function, the way the lights cycle. Or you might, as you've probably seen in intersections you can imagine, you might add a right turn lane or a left turn lane or, or one of each in different places. And then you plug that back into your traffic model and you, you, you check it again. And now oh, we're back to 65 seconds. All is good. Let's move on. That, that is really in many, many cases, that's the extent of the thought process that goes into those decisions. What, what doesn't ever get considered, I alluded to this before, so that that right turn lane now creates more distance that a person has to walk across the street. They're now crossing against more lanes of traffic where there's a potential for driver to run into them. Um, they also, since there's a longer distance for them to walk across that street, the, uh, you, you can picture an intersection that has a, a walk sign and then a don't walk sign. It has the countdown timer <clears throat> that, that note that the countdown timer, the number of seconds it's programmed so that if someone stepped off the curb, when the walk sign was on and it turned into a don't walk flashing, don't walk sign, they would have enough time to get across the street and uh, safely before the before the signal changed. Of course, that's necessary. Um, as we make the street wider, that countdown time, then what we call the clearance time, pedestrian clearance time, becomes longer. And now the whole intersection has a longer uh, time that it's to cycle through to, to serve everyone, to, to, you know, everyone, for everyone to get a green light, which actually in the tra- traffic models gives everyone more delay. And so now, We've created we've created a situation where we've solved this one problem, but now we're creating more delay for everyone else. And so the reaction is, okay, now we need more turn lanes, and then we create that. It's a it's a vicious cycle that we go through repeatedly. And you know, you, you're in Tallahassee, Florida is like a picture example of where this happens on a regular basis. Um, we you, you know you've got double and triple left turn lanes to to serve the traffic while it can and get us get us down to that non-failing level of service. Uh, and so like, that's just one, one specific example of the type of trade-off that, although it's programmed into the calculations, we don't ever think it through and question, well, what if we tried a different approach to solve this problem? Could we save ourselves from spending millions of dollars on this intersection and making everyone's lives more miserable? Um, 
but I mean, like another more big, you know, a more well, a very common example would just be in terms of trade-offs. You've got a street and it doesn't have any good place to bike, and so the city comes in. Or we're going to change this street, and some of the people in the community say we really want safe, protected bike lanes on this street because we don't feel safe biking on this street. And so the they go back to the drawing board and come back and say, well, you know, we're not we're not plowing over these buildings, so we've got this much space to work with. If we put in bike lanes, that means we have to remove parking along one side of the street. You know, hundreds of parking spaces, and that impacts a lot of people, right? Uh, and we do not have any way to measure in any in the least bit objective way the trade-off between a hundred parking spaces and a safe bike lane. They are, they are apples and oranges, and it it will it plays out time and time again as just a political battle, and whatever whatever sentiment wins political favor will be how we how we go. And so, and so that is the need that we see and that came, you know, slammed us in the face as we were beginning this research. That is the need that we need to try to address with this research. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that's fascinating. That, yeah, because that is apples and oranges. And usually what ends up happening is whatever lobby or <laughs> a person that shows up to the public meeting that's loudest gets their way or... <laughs> Um, which is not maybe a, a, a very uh, organized or thoughtful approach to it, right? <laughs> I mean, it is important to take into consideration what the community wants. And there are some places where, yeah, it, it can be different. And, the, and there are political situations that go both ways. Here where I live in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the city council actually enacted a law that identified certain streets that needed to have these protected separated bike lanes. And so now when the city goes to these meetings, if it's on those streets, they are their hands are tied. They cannot let the parking voices win, um, and so the, that in that case, the bike politics had more strength. Now that's this is a, a, a rarer situation than most places, but you know it plays out the same way. You can imagine how um, uh, I don't disenfranchise is too strong, but you can imagine how people who don't have an interest in biking and do have an interest in parking feel like they don't have a voice in that in that. Well, I think, you know, I think that's probably a good transition to kind of, you know, there's a piece, uh, I think in the, in the, in the description of the kind of the guide and uh, that talks about context and community priorities. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, and that's obviously, we haven't really talked about that yet, but like, that's obviously informs all of this, right. And in some ways that's what the community engagement is, is hoping to get at, but you know, how does that kind of fit into this conversation where like, you gotta be able to weigh parking versus bike lanes versus another, mm -hmm. maybe a turn lane. Uh, but what, what what else? What about the the context and the community priorities? That well, how do we kind of throw that in the mix too? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So that I think is the way forward. We most planning processes, most transportation planning processes, start with a, a goals and visioning session where we try and write down what it is we want this our place to be, what's important to us in our neighborhood, uh, and then we move from there and we, we look at the existing conditions analysis and then we go into alternatives analysis on and on and on. And we, we get to the place where we look at intersection, we look at um, transportation projects and we automatically by default go back, fall into the same trap I just described. We, we look at the intersection operations analysis and we get to a letter grade and then we decide, well, that's not possible. That won't work. It fails. And so we, we go back and then we change it until it, satisfies what's needed for operations and then we can talk about other things what what i think what we what we're proposing we do here is we keep the eyes on that vision and goals process the whole way through and so we set up our evaluation process to to consider all of those goals and how each idea each potential project satisfies the goals that we identified at the beginning so um, our first and most obvious example is safety. Every agency in the country says, will say to you that safety is their top priority. It's, it's, no one says otherwise. Every agency will say safety is their priority. And then they proceed time and again to make decisions that are less safe because actually they're top, they have many priorities because life is complicated because, <laughs> because uh, traffic, traffic is annoying and people get upset about it and not being able to find a parking space does create challenges. And so, um, we're saying we're saying two things. One, 
safety should be your top priority. That has been, um, you know, at the highest levels of government we and and down to local levels, we are we are committing ourselves to uh, um, eliminating fatalities and deaths on our streets. The federal U.S. DOT, Federal Highway Administration, state DOTs, cities are all listing that as their target, and it, we are not going to get there by making decisions the same way. And so, we what I want, what we want people to do is recognize that it, you are going to have to make unpopular decisions to get to these safety goals. We can start thinking about a street that is likely to result in crashes as a failing street. That's failure. Traffic is annoying. Traffic is a problem, but traffic doesn't have to mean failure. Killing people is failure. Um, I'm, and I, we're not naive to think that that's going to like per, permeate through the community right away because people are able to justify that traffic crashes are rare enough or that they won't happen to them um, and that sitting in congestion every day is going to affect them. And, you know, that's valid. It's definitely valid. But we have to remind ourselves and revisit what our goal and priorities are for the process. And then we can use the framework in the guide in the guidance to um, evaluate everything. Once we get a safe design, then we can evaluate whether we want to prioritize minimizing congestion or prioritize um, creating a place for people to sit outside their cafes and have coffee or, or what else, whatever else your community wants. Yeah. 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 No, that that's well said. And I think to your point, yeah, I think you're totally right. Like safety is maybe what folks say, but it's not, you know, what through your actions, it's not necessarily what's being done at these intersections, right? Through the actions of the local government or the, or the right. planning agency, right? Um, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, and I think, you know, and, you know, to underline maybe some of what we've already talked about, but the, it's safety for everyone, right? Not just those in cars or, um, you know, those, those that want to drive fast, but, you know, for folks that want to ride bikes and, and walk through that, their neighborhood and all that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, awesome. So, uh, to, you know, that, I think this is really, really cool and fascinating. I, I think the, some of the, the framework pieces are, are pretty interesting. So I guess, um, if I were, I don't, I don't know the best way to, to kind of set this up, but maybe as if, if, you know, if I'm a, you know, a transportation planner and, you know, some, some city somewhere and I want to kind of rethink, you know, the roadway space for, you know, a segment of street or, you know, an intersection, how, how can I use kind of the framework that you guys have developed to, to, to do that? Like what, what are maybe those steps or those pieces that, um, that would be, be, be part of that? Yeah. So to pitch the product itself, you're, you're going to put a link up and people can download. This is a free, a free guidebook that you can download online. Oh, you know, you download a PDF of the guide for free. It also includes a spreadsheet tool, which if, uh, I'm, I'm guessing this audience is higher uptake of spreadsheet tools than maybe the typical audience. So that's so that hopefully that works for them. <laughs> uh, so in the in the guidebook we have uh, a step by step framework, and in fact the whole guide is organized around these steps. And so, like I alluded to already, to put it simply, first figure out what your goals and priorities are. Second, what would it take to make this street safe for all users, for people walking, for people biking people and using the bus and people driving. Um, then then you, you figure out, okay, do I actually have enough space? So for example, say you've got a, I'm getting, I'm getting already, I can't even get it through the framework without getting into examples. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a street that is relatively narrow, um, it has enough room for two lanes of traffic, but maybe not more than that. And, and it's either got a lot of traffic on it or it's got fast moving traffic, you might not have enough room to provide what we would argue, what we what, what the research tells us is a safe bike lane. Uh, or maybe not enough room for a safe sidewalk, one, one or the other. Um, that's one kind of an example of, of a barrier. The guide then talks through, walks through all the different sort of, or many of the different types of what we call physical barriers to safe street design. Um, one, like the example I just described, there's also more like political barriers to safe street design. Like it really is infeasible to remove parking on this street because there's, it's, it's a row, it's a, a block full of row homes and no one has driveways and politically we're never going to take that parking out, right? There's all these things that, that play out. And so we suggest different ideas of maybe non-conventional or non-typical street layouts where we rethink, you know, we, we agree safety is a top priority. 
these are our barriers. These are our constraints. How can we work through um, different alternatives to, to, to make that work? And so um, for the example I just shared about like a, a narrow street that has traffic moving too fast, but there's not enough room for a bike lane. What is there a way we can realistically get traffic speeds down to a speed where people would feel comfortable biking on uh, in in the lane? Or can we can we reduce the amount of traffic on that street? Say there's a parallel street that also serves traffic. Could we get could we try and just you know using using built measures? Can we get, get people to drive on the other street so that now this street has less traffic and people can bike in the lane? Those are the sorts of things we want to think through. Another, just one more example there is, well, what if the street could be a one-way street instead of a two-way street? Now we have room to provide that physical separation. And none of these things are going to work everywhere in every context, but we try to help the reader think through more creatively and keeping in mind our, our, our goal is to, is to serve, is to meet this end, the safety end or, or whatever end. Um, let's ask ourselves everything else about the cross-section that we've assumed, are they, or do we have to assume those things? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, that's fascinating. So it's like hearing you talk and I, I, I'll, I'll do another example just because that I right. had one pop in my head as you were thinking, it's like, I, I know there's, and I'm sure everyone listening could think of a road like this in their, in their town where there's streets that are kind of want to, want to be everything to everyone where there's, mm-hmm. you know, two lanes of traffic, each direction that are high speed. And there's a bike lane that no one uses cause it's dangerous. And it's also, you know, a, along a bunch of businesses that have driveways in and out of it. And, you know, I think there that when you think through that that uh, that typical kind of I don't know I think the the strong towns the folks mm-hmm. would call them strodes like the that kind of where it's kind of trying to be be a lot of different things when you think through that in terms of safety like that's not very safe but it's also like not trying you're trying to do too many things at once the, that context exactly. and priorities are there's there's just too much in there and so then how do you think through what those you know what the priority should be and then and then that maybe help helps with the design more than than just throwing everything on the street or in the red way absolutely this is another core um, tenet of our research of our guidebook <clears throat> and we borrowed this from the dutch um, who who established for every road whether their function is to serve an access purpose meaning people should be able to get to destinations on the street or a distributor surface, surf, purpose, excuse me, where people would use this street to get to other streets so then they can get to their location. And yeah, Chuck Marone talks a lot about strodes and exactly what they're doing is both of those things. And it is not possible to, to design a street uh, safely and, and try and serve both those purposes. So in the framework, we do talk about trying to, it's, it's in the first step actually, Determine whether you want your street to be an access street, in which case traffic should move slowly and there should be lots of opportunities to get to destinations, or a distributor street, in which case it's perfectly fine for traffic to move faster, but you need full separation for from between traffic and people biking and people walking. And you should not have you should have as few driveways as inside street openings as possible <clears throat> because that's where the that's where the, the threat comes to people that aren't in cars um, the implications of that are unfortunately dramatic you know you can picture that street you were just imagining <clears throat> has a ton of driveways the people the developers the the business owners who put their their livelihood in those plazas rely on those driveways to get to you know to make their make their living and and it's not so easy for a government entity to come in and say well we're closing three quarters of the driveways on this street you guys all have to figure it out um, so and still that is what's needed <laughs> so <clears throat> so from a more pragmatic approach i think we want to make that decision about whether the streets serve job uh, function is is um, access or distributor and I think for these these six lane arterials that we're imagining, their function is probably distributor. And so over time, we need to use the levers that we have when things get redeveloped, when we have construction projects and different opportunities we have to reduce those conflict points as much as possible. And, is, and by saying this street's function is distributor, every time we have an opportunity to look at that street again, we go back to that and we remind ourselves, that's right, this is a distributor street. We need to 
increase separation between modes and decrease access. Mm. Mm. Well, and it's, oh, the, the, the separating modes, I think that's, can you talk more about that? Cause that's, that's the piece that I, I think, um, that I think the word that this could get kind of be really helpful for folks that, uh, in cities and, and be really, I think pretty radical for people that want to see more, <laughs> more, yeah. uh, infrastructure for bikes. It's like, it, it's, I think, yeah, I want you to talk more about that and then maybe I'll, I'll add my okay. two cents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. <clears throat> um, right. So this, this term I use, I sometimes use the terms interchangeably protected bike lane or separated bike lane. Yeah. These, this is the Dutch style bike lanes that, um, you know, not just Dutch, but lots of places around the world, um, that create a separate space in the street for people biking that is you know, not shared with people walking and has some sort of physical barrier between the people biking and, and traffic. Yeah. Um, that is the design that is necessary on any street that is really over 30 miles per hour. Um, mm. and, and even at lower speeds, if there's a lot of traffic on it, um, which is a lot of our streets. Yeah. Um, but th that separation is, is required both for safety and for comfort. Um, just in a meeting today with the city of Orlando and yeah. they just built a um, sort of temporary separated bike lane on a busy four lane street. They took out a lane of parking and put in a bike lane and the street is, you know, between two neighborhoods and has a, has an elementary school on it. So it's used by a lot of people who need to walk and bike. Yeah. And, um, it's just built with sort of, it's not like a, not like a sidewalk level separated bike lane. It's just built with a, you know, within the street right away with a relatively simple delineator between traffic and, and, um, and bikes. And they, the city has been doing surveys to understand how people are experiencing it. And, um, some of about half of the survey respondents are parents of kids who go to school there go to school at the school and they asked, do you feel like your kids are safe riding on the street now? And before, remember, this is a four lane arterial with no bike lanes. You would never dream of seeing a kid bike on the street. And 91% of parents said they felt like their kids were safe on this street just by adding that separation on the, on the and a place for people to bike. Wow. That's amazing. That's a huge turnaround. A huge turnaround and a huge opportunity. If you think about the, the amount of trips that people make in cities and suburbs that are relatively short, you know, three miles or less and rel very easy to bike on. If you create that high level of comfort and safety feeling uh, on any meaning, any meaningful level of a network, we're going to have see significant shift toward biking for many trips. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's, <laughs> I think this is where one of my soapbox things that I related to this is like, I think you go, it's easy to go around a lot of cities, I, I, places I've lived where, you know, there's a bike lane technically on a road, <laughs> but no one's going to use it because it's, you know, high right. speeds, it's not separated and no one feels safe except maybe the most advanced bike riders or the people that are like mm -hmm. comfortable battling cars and yelling at them on their bikes. <laughs> <laughs> but like if you have some design standards where it's, Hey, if this, if you want to do a bike lane on a street that has this level of speed, you got to create some separation. I, I, that creates so much more, um, I don't know, more, more opportunity, more access for folks, more, I don't know. It's more than just the, the professional bikers that are out there now. And it's, it's more available to everybody. Absolutely. Uh, um, and that's the direction a lot of places are going. It's not, it's not going to come without um, opposition change yeah. is hard for people for all people and it's and it's like it's hard to imagine something being that different from what you're used to and so yeah. you know this is not what we're talking about today but these pop-up demonstration quick build changes to streets are i think really transforming the way people can talk and think about places and um, and start to imagine a different way of a street working without, um, um, you know, without the anxiety and, and frustration that comes through our traditional thought process. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, so obviously we'll, we'll link to the, 
the the, the guide and, and and have give folks access to that so they can they can explore it and and hopefully use it in their own communities um are there any other kind of uh pieces of the framework or the um some of the things you guys thought through that we haven't touched on already that, that you wanted to highlight yeah just maybe i i was walking through the framework and then i got myself sidetracked talking oh, yeah. about <laughs> physical barriers um, yeah. in a lot of cases you'll go through the steps of um, the goals the safe design and then you actually have plenty of space to design a safe street yeah you know, any of these big streets we were just talking about um, one of the things that we assume is that you for safety you only need one lane of traffic in each direction mm. um, for other reasons you very well may want more um, but the guide also has a process to help people work through all right i've got my safe dimension and now i have all that i've got 40 extra feet what do i do with it um, and so we, we did, uh, the team that I worked with did an incredible amount of research to understand what are the trade-offs, what are the benefits or drawbacks of all different types of changes to streets huh, through yeah. a variety of what we call high-level goals. So, you know, setting, we talked about safety already, we've talked about traffic, but there's also environmental goals, mm. both, both thinking about like local air quality, quality as well as larger things of, you know, going to climate change. Yeah, or like stormwater. Yeah, yeah, stormwater. Um, we talked about equity. What what mm. what sorts of changes to streets perform better or worse if a goal of your community is to create a more equitable transportation system? Mm. Um, economy is another one. What are the impacts to businesses by making different changes to streets? So you know you'll you could removing on street parking from a neighborhood is often cited as a death knell for businesses. Uh, and we have some research that we, we have research that shares or that points to what has happened in different places where parking's been removed, where bike lanes have been added. Uh, in in most cases, adding bike lanes has the impact of creating more opportunity for people to access your business than parking does, and so you yep. see an improvement to business, not not uh, a loss of business. Yeah. Um, so we we have a set of figures and then an immense matrix of information in the, in the appendix that talks that talks to the various impacts of making your this lane a little bit smaller or changing this from a parking lane to a sidewalk cafes and, and on and on that i think is really useful for thinking through those more sort of big picture opportunities when you've got a wider street or when you want to transform the way a place works yeah yeah Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, because there are these other pieces that you can use that right away for. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Transportation decisions affect so many things. Yeah. If you think about think about your cities, right? Transportation affects a lot of things. And for sixty years, we've asked what it does for traffic, and then not anything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, there are other things. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, that that's that's really helpful. So. Um, I guess uh, just maybe as a way to kind of wrap up our conversation is, it, um, and we not that we're I'm trying to rush you out or anything, but <laughs> as a way to to like if I if I were you know a planner inspired by kind of you know this conversation or a, you know read went through the guide and I'm like oh my gosh I really want to try this in my community and you, you've you've I think touched on this a little bit already but I'd be curious about you know if you were to put put yourself in their shoes how would you kind of take take this guide and, and, and try and use it in, in your, in your day job? Is it, would you start with a small project? Would you, would you start with, you know, something bigger? Like what, what would be the kind of, maybe the way, um, you know, someone that wants to try and implement this in their, in their day job, <laughs> what, what would maybe be your, your, your advice to them on, on how to do it on, on what kind of, uh, where to start? I think that you can use it anytime you're thinking through how a street should function. So you talked yeah. about like a simple repaving project or a big, corridor redesign where there's been, you know, you've won a federal grant to redo a corridor. Um, the guide is, you know, I like to think hopefully a useful resource, but the process that is underneath it is, is simple and a- applicable to any, any work that we do in that space. And so, yeah. um, like I alluded to earlier, we already go through some of these steps. We do the analysis to figure out, wow, what the street opportunity is. We ask the community what their goals are. It's about reminding ourselves and committing ourselves to 
understanding how the potential futures, the potential alternatives that we evaluate score or perform against these goals. Mm -hmm. And then it's the, the second piece is keeping, and, and this is not every place would have to think this, but I think that they should and, and would say they do, keeping safety at the forefront. Yeah. And every, anytime that we compromise on safety, asking ourselves, are, isn't safety our top priority? And you know, if it's not our top priority, I think that city officials need to be able to come to a public meeting and say, we decided that in this context, parking was more important than safety. And if you can't say that to the community, then you've got to ask yourself if you're doing the work right. Yeah. 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 Well, and being honest about it too, right? Where you're not just saying safety is the priority, but you know, you're, you're, you're proving it through the design. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I do think there are real situations where we, I mean, I've already said that we have made decisions where safety is yeah. not top priority. Um, and so I think that we owe our communities the service of, being honest about it. Yeah. Well, and that, I mean, I think that that piece uh, ties into one other thing I wanted to talk with you about was uh, the kind of role of community engagement. So, you know, I'm, I, if, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like kind of from what you're saying that, that maybe that role is on the front end of like, what is the purpose of the street for? What do you guys want to see out of the use of this right of way? And then, and now, now you can go and do the, the engineering in the background and use the guide to kind of walk through mm -hmm. what that would mean. Is that kind of the role of that? And then, and then maybe, you know, obviously getting feedback, but how, how do you kind of see that, that role of the community as part of this kind of redesign process? Yeah, I think that, well, I think a couple of things. One, I think that in some places, the community may be the one that brings this approach yeah. to their agency. That's a good point. Yeah. And um, hopefully it, it resonates. And um, I think it's, it's all relatively reasonable and straightforward. And so, um, you know, I'm hopeful that that could be one way that this transpires. But the other, if, it, if it's starting from, you know, within the walls of City Hall, yeah, walk, go through the same process with the community, do it alongside them. So as we've talked about a few times, start with what is the vision and goals. Um, and then, you know, okay, we went back and we figured out this is what it would take to make this street safe. And now we've got either a, a, we've got this extra space that we want to talk to you about what your priorities are for how to use it, or B, we don't have enough space to design the street safely given the assumptions we started with. So we want mm -hmm. to work with you to rethink these assumptions. Um, you know, I know that the community process can be fraught and yeah. it's one of the biggest challenges in our industry right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, it probably trickles down from some of the challenges we're seeing in national politics as well, but we want to, you know, wherever we can engage in conversations and honest conversations, I want to try to do that. And I think, um, giving the community the the trust and benefit of the doubt that we can talk about this in an honest, transparent way, hopefully we'll be rewarded with that coming back to you. Um, yeah. Although I know that it won't always be, <laughs> I think it's the best place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, well, so before we kind of uh, fully wrap up, what, what's next? What are you working on that, you know, now that our, that our, that our listeners can look out for, is there anything else that, that's coming? Uh, any other big reports? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, NCHRP, back to that acronym, is going to be hiring a consultant to help spread this research. Um, I don't, I don't know that we'll win that work, but we will try to, um, and and that will involve going out to cities and states around the country with trainings and um, workshops and case studies and, and all sorts of good things to, to practice and try to you know. Uh, test the method and see if we can refine it and get it out there better. But the one thing that I um, did, I glossed over a little bit today that I'm actually maybe most excited about, or what's, what's resonated the most as we've gone around talking about this research is um, what we're, we're still workshopping a name, but we're calling the all day operations framework or the 24 hour operations framework, which uh, I, ta I talked at the very beginning about our industry's focus on the peak 15 minutes and, Instead of instead of or in addition to thinking about how it the street functions during the during rush hour, the all the operations framework can help talk about how efficiently is this street serving our community across the whole day. And so, um, if you've got traffic demand, traffic volumes that are at you know the their height during your morning rush hour, 
and then drop off to half that volume throughout the rest of the day, you've got half your street capacity is unused across the day. And so that's a pretty inefficient way to use space. And so the, this framework really just helps to visualize and articulate that um, efficiency opportunity, opportunity. And so instead of saying, okay, we fail at 15 minutes, let's think of something new. We can say, all right, so for 15 minutes of the day, we're going to be in, in a congested condition. But, it, but if we choose this, this smaller street section, we will be better utilizing the, the street over the you know, 16 hours a day when people are up and about in using, our, using our streets. And, and that could be a better outcome. Um, it's just about trying to, you know, some of the, just the shorthand language we use, the customs that we have, we just, we just stop talking once we get to that quote unquote failure. And so hopefully with some more methods, some more analysis, some more um, uh, statistics about the street's performance, we can have that broader conversation. And so we are hoping to really develop and advance that. My colleagues and I wrote a paper that we, uh, that was accepted to be presented at the our annual transportation research conference in January. Um, and then we're going to keep working on that. And Kittleson, the company, will be pushing it out. And also we're trying to embed it in some future research that we're doing. So that's that's where I'm uh, hopeful that we can go next. Awesome. Very cool. I like all-day framework. I think I think you got something there. <laughs> all-day framework. All right, cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, and, I, and I think, you know, to underline that one a little bit, I, the, not to bring the... Uh, the budget analyst out in me in me out, but mm -hmm. it's a better investment when you're using when you're taking advantage of that right away because streets are expensive, right? Yeah. So when you're, yeah. you're when you're taking advantage exactly. of that investment like throughout the whole day, that it's just a better investment. It's it's a it's better for the city. It's better for the community. It's better for I mean the tax taxpayer. Not to spoil it all down to that, but absolutely. Yeah. I mean that that is important. Streets are expensive both from a capital cost but also an opportunity cost. They're yes. incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they make up 80% of our public space in our cities. And, you know, we could think about how we want to use our public space more broadly. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Awesome. Well, uh, so, you know, Connor, I really appreciate you coming on, but the hardest yeah, question I you. ask is, is, is the one we end on. So if, if you, <laughs> if you could be the governor of DJ for this episode, uh, what, what song would you pick as the exit music? <laughs> that is such a good question. And I am, I love, I really appreciate when good, music is used at, at intros or exit to, you know, radio segments or podcasts. And so when you put this question to me, I felt like I was paralyzed for, for <laughs> half the day. Uh, and I have this unique problem where when I listen to music, I don't really hear or bother with lyrics. I just uh, like the way music sounds. So yeah. I went through some of my favorite songs. Like, you know, I, I like a lot of uh, like, like the offspring and Goldfinger and these, these nineties rock punk bands. Um, but I think the safest answer is probably, I would say, Loud Pipes by Ratatat, which has no words and has a great sound to it. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. They're perfect. We'll get that queued up. Uh, well, that ends <laughs> our episode for today. Connor, I really appreciate you coming on and chat with me. That um, This has been a really fun conversation, and, and I really appreciate you sharing yeah. your work. Likewise. Thanks so much. And for our listeners, GovLove is brought to you by engaging local government leaders. And the best, best way to support this podcast is to become an ELGL member. You can reach us online at ELGL.org slash podcast. Um, and if uh, you're, you should subscribe to GovLove on your favorite podcast app. If you're already subscribed, go tell a friend or colleague about this podcast. Or, or heck, leave us a five-star review on, on whatever service you're subscribed. Help us spread the word that GovLove is the go-to place for local government stories. And with that, thank you for listening. This has been GovLove, a podcast about local government. Thank you.